Do I need to hit record on this? It's I was recording. trying to see. Are those numbers going down? Should be recording. Okay, okay. Then we'll just edit that. So it is Wednesday afternoon, February 5th. We are picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 1. And we are still in verse 2. In fact, we're at the beginning of verse 2. Last week we took a long time, so I'm only going to just hit highlights for a quick review. We're in the phrase, the beginning phrase, the earth was formless and void. We looked to the Hebrew to help us understand because Isaiah, Yeshaya, Isaiah 45, 18 told us the earth was not made without form and void. So we either have the first conflict in scripture and we have to go tell those people that, yeah, scripture contradicts itself, or we have to dig and find our answer. In digging, we found out that our Hebrew can easily and should have been translated, the earth became without form and void. So did we know what happened during that time? Why did it become without form and void? We looked at that, and we looked at, uh, and by the way, the Hebrew for this name also, but it's on the, the last one, is tohu, zavohu, is the same words in Isaiah. Those words are also used um, in Isaiah 34 and in Jeremiah. Each time, it is always, um, the phrase is always following a time when there was a judgment, that this judgment is what brought the, without form and void, brought the, uh, I don't like the word chaos, but that's all that's coming to my mind. It, it brought the, oh, there's a word today, and I'll have it, it'll come to me. Um, I'm looking to see if my nose and my eyes aren't falling out, but you get my idea that there, there needed to be some sort of restoration. So we like to see a scripture shows anything that we could glean that had happened during that time. We did see from the earth itself that I think the face of it bears the marks of the catastrophe, our, um, our further detail into it we saw from um, Genesis, and we'll pick that up when we get there again in chapter 2 that the earth was originally called Eden, apparently. When it was called Eden, that tipped us off to look at Isaiah, and I think we also looked at Ezekiel. It's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28. This is on your cross-references. We saw that we came to the conclusion that Satan, Satan, had a kingdom here on earth. This was his domain. When he became full of himself, wanted to replace God, the i i i i this, remember? We know that he was judged, that his kingdom was taken from him. We see that apparently that's when, like a flood of some sort that we see God will use in judgment in Noah's day, apparently he used also with Satan's kingdom, and we saw that what was on the outside of the earth is now on the inside. We saw several different changes that we saw from the Hebrew and from putting these scriptures together that apparently um, God brought a judgment onto the earth that brought the earth without form and void and now we're going to go on and get the restoration, the restoration, the recreation of the earth in the way that we know and this was all pre-Adamic, pre-Adam so that it's not anything that took place during man's time the only way that man could know about it is revelation from God. We'll be talking more about that as we go along with it also. The name given to this belief, if you hear it, is called the gap theory. There are those who are um, against the gap theory. They believe, and this is what I didn't bring out strongly last week, so I'm picking up new here. They do not believe um, that the, okay, the earth shows geological ages and they age parts of the earth by that, the way that the strata is formed and that sort of thing. And so there are those who put those different times between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, and they put that in with the gap theory. Now, not everybody in the gap theory believes that, but there are those who do. The problem with that is, yes, it could have taken place during that time. We do know we have a very old earth. We don't have old people. We have an old earth. We know that, that man has only been here less than 6,000 years from Adam to today. But we know the earth is much older than that. Even though a lot of the scientific dating like carbon-14 has its problems. There are those who believe that the strata that you're seeing, those changes that you're seeing, took place during Noah's flood. That that's what brought the changes. They argue that in the scientific world back and forth. Whether all that could have happened 
if the flood was so great to cause it to happen, they believe that it would have blown the face of the earth off and there wouldn't be any evidence left. There are others who say no, it definitely shows the signs of a, of a flood and it is within the realm of it happening. But remember when I started this, I told you that the, the study of Genesis and of creation wasn't to teach us scientifically how creation goes, but for how we can go to God. How we can meet God is how God goes. So I'm not here to say I can give you every scientific answer. I can answer every scientist and I can say it's this way and it's this way. No, I can't. But I love the way God has presented it to us. He just starts out with plain, simple fact. He begins with God. No room for argument. No room for God not existing. No room for there being more than one God. God. And then he tells us he created. And he just simply lays it out there. He gives us enough knowledge of creation to realize we have a master creator, a master designer. And as we move along, we're going to see that he chooses right from the very beginning to have relationship with his creation of man. So we get a lot in a very little bit of space that's critical. If we were to try to hit all the scientific and get bogged down and all that, we'd be carrying around big science books and we'd be talking about that for eons. And we'd miss the whole point. The whole point is to know our God and how to have that relationship with him. So, I bring out to you this evidence of the gap theory because I do happen to believe that it makes our scriptures not contradict each other. So I think it has to be right. That's my personal opinion. Again, use your mind. You're free to decide however you do decide. One other thing that they do not like about the gap theory is it brings a form of death before Adam and Eve were created. Because there was, um, they believe like the dinosaurs and, and things like that were there during that time and they died off and weren't in the recreated world as we have it. Again, I'm not here to say which side the dinosaurs were on, but their problem with there couldn't be death because there hadn't been sin yet, because Adam and Eve hadn't sinned yet, is limiting God. Because look at Satan. He sinned. He had a consequence and a judgment before God ever created Adam. So who is to say that death can only be the result of Adamic sin in this world in this time only. Yeah, but it's one of the problems they have with it. So again, just I want to be fair. I want to bring it out to you. I encourage you. If it floats your boat, go study it some more. <laughs> okay? Is it dull or they do believe there's a change in between chapters one and two? The gap theory believes there is versus one and two. The gap, gap theory says there's a gap. There's a gap in time. Remember we looked at other Between references? Yes. Okay. Remember we looked at how a reference will talk about the Lord's first coming, and it'll talk about a second coming in one verse, and yet we know there's at least 2,000 years between those two times. Okay, so we see gaps in, in time in our verses. So the gap there means there is a gap, that there is a time, a period that something happened here. So, yeah, so if you agree with that, then you are a, a proponent of it, not an opponent. When we talk about sin, mm -hmm. so Satan's sin is not the same as it's, sin. It's not the same as human sin, but when God says pride is sin, I believe that goes beyond yes. man. That's, if it's found in the angels, if it's found in man, it's sin, it's wrong. <clears throat> God created Lucifer beautiful. He created him perfect. He said you were the sum of beauty until sin was found in you, until pride was found in you. I forget which word it says in, in Isaiah. Let's look at it real fast because I don't want to teach it wrong. Um, Isaiah 14 is where I'm headed real quickly. Um, Isaiah 14, and we are looking at verse 12. Um, maybe it's Ezekiel 28 that says the sum of beauty. Okay, I'm going to Ezekiel real quick. I either glance too fast or it's in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28, and it's in Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, 12 
starts out telling us that they're talking about the sun of Tyre, but we know from what's told that it goes beyond. That remember we have a type and a greater type, just like we have Antiochus Epiphanes, be a type of the Antichrist. We have you know symbolism used in scripture in many different times. So scripture can do that. And when you read all this, we know that that uh, the king of Tyre was not uh, the description in Ezekiel 28 from verse 12 on does not fit him. He was not an anointed cherub. He was a human being. So we see it's going beyond. But in Ezekiel 28, 12, when it goes beyond the king of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, thou sealest up the sun, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. So see, he, he created um, Satan beautiful. He created him the sum of beauty. He created him full of wisdom. So he was quite a creation. Um, he, he apparently was in some way a brighter creation than other angels. He excelled above the other angels, we see, and was probably had um, a hierarchy. that He was probably over other angels. We know that there were angels who followed him who wanted him to be God. But I cannot call that anything other than sin. That brought up your question last week of how does Satan go into heaven then because we, we say heaven has to be sinless. Well, we have to remember we're still trying to understand the heavenlies with earthbound minds, earthbound abilities to think and to try to figure this out. I, for one, will love if, if the Lord puts on a, a movie for us when we're there with him and shows us how he created and how he did all this because I've got a ton of questions. But what I want to bring to us is we do know, and it sounds like, and it's, it's given to us in language we can understand, it sounds like God's sitting on his throne and Satan's coming right up to the throne to accuse the brethren. That is, you know, just as if, forgive me, because you're anything but, but just as if Dora were, were the one right now saying, you know, I'm Satan and I'm, I'm calling this one out. But we don't know if it's exactly like that. It can be that, that the voices are heard in the heavens. You know, we don't know exactly how this is. But I do know that Satan has not been able to corrupt heaven. We're promised to that. We're promised in our heavenly home, never will sin enter in. There'll never be a repeat. In the new heavens and the new earth, it will never corrupt in the way that this has. So in some way that I cannot explain to you, because I don't have full understanding, I just know that, that Satan has not come in and infected heaven. Amen. Um, there's, God has not allowed that. For humanity to enter into heaven, there has to be human blood. There has to be the sacrifice. That's why God had to become man. He couldn't just become a lamb. He is called the Lamb of God, and the lambs are the picture for us, but he had to become a man. He had become man to save man. If he had chosen to save the angels who fell, I believe he would have had to come into angelic form to save the angels in an angelic way. He chose not to do that, I think, because they were in his very presence. Yeah. They saw him. They didn't have the, the problem of being deceived or lack of knowledge that we as humans have. So I think God held them to a higher responsibility. And when they chose in his presence, he didn't have grace for them. He didn't have mercy to extend to them. But when Satan, and I didn't finish my thought earlier, who we believe had Eden, had this kingdom, lost this kingdom, he sees what's going on. He sees that God has restored his kingdom and put man in charge of it. And he's throwing a hissy fit. That was mine. And I want it back. And I'm going to go after Adam. And I'm going to get it back from him. And he does. Now he doesn't come in and say, get it back. He's too smart for that. So he comes in in his beauty. And he comes in very deceptively. And he goes to eat first. Who the scripture tells us clearly was deceived. Or Adam clearly chose. Both are wrong, both sin, both fall, both suffer the consequences. But, you know, he was, and we use it, you know, we say, you know, it's sneaky like a snake. Why do we say that? Because that's the connotation that's come down to us. 
But remember when he was in the garden talking to Eve, she didn't go, <gasps> a talking snake? <laughs> so the animals have more ability than we realize. They also suffer in the curse. I believe they lost the ability to communicate clearly in languages we do today. They still communicate. If you ever own a dog or a cat, you know they communicate, but not in the same way that I think they did prior. But he came in, in, in his beauty and cunning, he came in to deceive. He came in to sow doubt. Did God tell you that? Did he say, you won't, you know, you're going to be like him? I mean, he sowed doubt right from the beginning, right from the get-go. And he hit on the very thing that brought him down. Pride. Pride. How many of us want to feel like we're done? <laughs> we don't. We want to be. Oh, I am smart. I mean, you tell a little one that, and you watch them strut like a peacock. <laughs> so he knew how to weasel his way in, and he succeeded, and he got this earth back. That's why we have the problems we have today. Remember, Scripture calls him the prince of the power of the air. They're talking about the air that, that is above us, but they're talking about the air that's between us and our heavenly home. And I believe that the Lord even literally made a path through Satan's domain that we go through to get into heaven safely because Scripture seems to indicate that that's a study for another day. But if for us to go into heaven, once that sin was entered into us, God could have said, that's it. I've closed heaven's doors. It's sealed off. This people will never come into my presence. And what would have been even a divorce, well, just horribly sad too, is if he would have allowed them to keep eating from the tree that kept them alive continually. So if we would have stayed in this state forever, thank you, God. Thank you, God. This is long enough and bad enough. I'll get you in just a moment, Arlo. I know you've had your hand up. I'm sorry. But to finish my thought, to bring it through clearly, he said, I love so much that before I even created the foundations of the earth, I died for these. We know that God said it in Scripture, for God so loved the world. world. He didn't say I love the elect, and he didn't say I love the ones I choose, and he didn't say I love... The Jews, he said, I love the world. We know his death was for the world, his resurrection also with the power of the world, and he took his blood, human blood, because he entered into man's world to save man. He took that blood, put that on the mercy seat in heaven, and that's what broke up in heaven, why we can now go, not into the heart of the earth as had been prior, into the paradise side of Sheol, but now we could go into the very presence of God. That had all to be accomplished through human blood. And to prove my point, you get to the book of Revelation and you have, and I brought this out last week, so this is review, but it's still good to hear it and to see it in its entirety. You have the lamb who, who appeared as had he been slain, who's also called the lion of the tribe of Judah, who was the only one found in heaven, earth, under the earth, in the atmosphere, wherever you went, the only one who could take that deed from the hand of God, and that deed is a grant deed to the earth. Yeshua, Jesus, is the one who could take it, who could break open its seals, which shows it's his, it's his authority. He purchased back this earth. Hallelujah. Now, yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> now, we don't see that in the way we want to see it yet, but we know that we'll see a better taste of it in the millennial, when Satan's bound in the pit, not able to work his havoc, wreak his trouble wherever he goes, but we still know man's still free to make choice, and man's still going to make wrong choice. So many are going to still follow Satan when they're given the chance. It's mind-boggling that we get on the other side of that. After the Lord puts a stop to that, we have Satan in cast in hell forever. We have a new heavens and a new earth made for us to enjoy, for all of mankind to enjoy, and all the rest of God's creation forever in a 100% sin-free environment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the whole ultimate plan. I'll come right back to you, but I promised our loop. Oh, yes. Um, I was searching and, um, about Satan not being given the chance of salvation. 
And uh, what is there? Is there any direct um, scripture? There's so many ways to. We just don't it. see God extended to him, and we see they're still in the battle through the ages. He's still battling God right now. He's not repentant. He's not wanting forgiveness. He's still wanting to be in the face of God. He's going to enter the Antichrist to receive the worship for himself at the midpoint in the tribulation because that's still his goal. So, no, we don't see God extend a salvation to him. But again, I think, number one, because he was in the presence of God and chose this path. And number two, because there is no repentance. Well, there is no heart. Be, yeah. uh, to be uh, an enemy. Yes, yes. Yes, he chose to be an enemy of God. And even those that, that God has gifted with salvation, he's never forced that on anyone. They all have to choose it. Granted, no one chooses, but the Holy Spirit tugs them first, brings them. But remember, we've talked about how everyone has that chance, and we went through that before also. But when they do respond, even a little, then God gives them more light and more light and more light. He keeps drawing them in and drawing them in and drawing them in. We've all seen the evidence of that. Some of you can tell me that in your very own life. You can see how God's hand kept drawing you. But there was a response to it. If it was like Pharaoh, whose heart hardened, and people said, oh, yeah, see, there's proof. God did it to him. Take a lump of wax and take a lump of clay. Put them in the sunlight. One melts, one hardens. How did God harden Pharaoh's heart? He gave him the truth. He showed him the truth. The truth hardened Pharaoh's heart. So where it, you, it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, he hardened it in the sense that he brought him the truth. He hardened his heart against the truth. Sad, sad. And I worry about that, wrong word, but I do worry about that, with people we're sharing faith with, who sometimes get hardened. The more they hear, the more they reject. And God says, don't sin away your day of salvation. How do they send it away when that heart is so hardened and so closed that it has made that permanent rejection? And only God knows when that time is. Don't ever judge it for God. You have no business being in that place. If there is life, there is hope. If they're on their deathbed, if they're in a coma, get in their ear and preach to them in loving words simply what they need to do because even at that last moment, the Lord took the thief on the cross with him into paradise. He didn't say, no, you didn't serve me one day. I'm not going to give you this reward. No, his love is to the last moment of breath. Most, I think, don't make that final rejection until that last moment. But when they leave this earth, they have made that decision. Even if they think they haven't, not making a decision, made a decision. Mm -hmm. you know, truthfully, there's nobody in the middle. You are either on the Lord's side or you're not. So that you can change while you're alive. Gary. We don't really know what caused sin. No cause for sin. If you say there was a cause for sin, then God caused it. But it's interesting. If you look in Ezekiel 28, 17, it looks like maybe Christ or beauty. And it depends on the translation. The NLT says, your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. Your wisdom is corrupted by your love is planted. So maybe that's something to do with how, how yeah. beautiful. Um, yeah, because he didn't make Satan any more than he had has us puppets, you know. So, and it could be that his beauty he caught it was caught up in himself. I think that is what Scripture says to us. And don't we see that on our earth today? That people that get caught up in themselves and think they are so wonderful are the hardest to reach because they don't see that need. So, in essence, yes. But, I'm sorry. Illusion. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. But it, but I think even though the translations are alluding to that same thought, that it does seem to be his beauty that caught him up. Yeah. You know, that, that did. But it's not, that's God's fault. You know, God's not at fault. And would there be a repentant heart? I think God would have even made room. 
for Satan because that's just who my God is. Not one of us deserves it. Not one of us has earned it. You know, God just freely gives it. And I am so thankful. Well, you know, and we can see that in the scripture it says that the, the Lord gave them to their own desires. It's because he brought the truth that then we have the, uh, the free will to so accept or right. reject. Right. And I think that the right. same thing with, with Pharaoh. You know, yes, the that's what I'm God trying to say. It, exactly. So he, it's not that God hardened his heart, but the, the Lord said, this is what you're choosing, mm -hmm. then you're going to continue on whatever right. you choose. Right. Mm -hmm. But another thing is that what is interesting to me is that Satan, when he was deceiving um, Eve, he was deceiving Eve the same way with his own desires. Mm -hmm. Because he says, mm -hmm. so I try to bring that. Right. Like the most high. Right. And he told her, you'll be like God. You're going to know what God knows. You're not going to know less. You're not going to die. It's going to be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was. He had to trip her up because it is what tripped him up. Yeah. Well, the day he goes to pride. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's why God hates pride. We, we read that scripture, one of the sins God hates the most. You know, there really isn't different levels of sins. We use that, but if you've committed whatever you consider the, the smallest, most minutest, you know, the least bad, <laughs> whatever that is in your mind, if you just did that once, it's still sin. It's still sin. It still knocked you out of eternity with the Lord. It made you in need of redemption. So it's not just, you know, we all put bigger sins, you know, we can categorize everything. But God does not judge in that same way. Um, but he does hate certain things more, just like we abhor certain things more, and pride is one. And I do think it is because it was that pride that brought Satan down. It's the pride that brought Adam and Eve down. It's the pride that causes us to have all the suffering that we have today. But when it's bothering you, and when it feels overwhelming, and when you feel like we're living in a cesspool, and yes, I... We, we are just turn on the news <laughs> just remember in the time of eternity and I have to put that in quotes because there is no time in eternity but you get my point this is the drop in the bucket this is like one raindrop out of the whole entire world of oceans and beyond thankfully even though we feel this is so long this is so short in comparison and what does it do for us for all the rest of our eternity, we will appreciate it in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise. When we realize that great cost that our Savior paid, when we realize mercy was expanded even more than what we're able to understand mm -hmm. now, we are absolutely going to fall on our faces in humble adoration, thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. For sure. mm -hmm. And I think that's why God's grace is is given to us when we have to every day oh, yes. ask him for forgiveness because we fail every day. Every we day. continue to confess our sins to keep our relationship open. Mm -hmm. He has already forgiven us past, present, and future, Amen. which gives us no right to go and do whatever we want. Paul said, may it never be. And he put it the strongest way he could put that. It's not <coughs> that. But thankfully, otherwise you would need to fear if I died suddenly and I didn't ask forgiveness that day, I'm in trouble. No, it's not that way. We're forgiven. The Lord, the God looks at us as if we had not sinned because he looks at us through the shed blood of, of the shoe of Jesus. But we need to continually, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, help me not. Lord, change me. Mold me. Make me like you. Let the words that come out of my mouth be no corruption. Let them be what builds up. Let them be an example of you to my neighbor. You know, sometimes our actions are so loud, they don't even hear the words we say, let alone when the words come out. <laughs> so, okay, so I think we've covered it well. Uh, I think we're ready for our next word. Amazing. <laughs> so, we've covered the earth was formless and void. We decided how that happened, and now we know we're going to be looking at a restoration, a recreation, however you want to put it. We come to a very interesting word, darkness. 
was over the surface of the deep. Now, because I'm not in any hurry, we're going to stop with the word darkness. Because <laughs> we want the full depth of the word, do we not? Darkness is even an emblem for Satan, for Satan. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. These are uh, references that you may be very familiar with. That will help, but if not, we'll read it anyway. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. It is on your cross-reference charts. Um, on your cross-references, it is E. You're on E. We've gone through ABCD, you're on E. You know, I just realized I always alphabetize those pages because my notes are the numeric. That you all don't have my notes. Maybe I should, maybe I'll switch out and go to numbers if that makes it easier on you. It would be easier. Okay. Okay. We only have twenty-six letters. We only have twenty-six letters. Well, I've been known to do double A's and double B's. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'll switch out for you. And if you want new pages, I can do that, or you can just cross out your A or put A equals one, B equals two. I know you're all smart enough to do that. <laughs> okay, Ephesians 6.12 tells us, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. Notice how the darkness, uh, and I should finish it, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We know that's God about Satan, his henchmen, that are in control of those areas, and that that's who we do battle against. That's why we can't battle in our flesh and blood. We have to battle in the spirit. We have to put on the spiritual armor. If you don't know that armor, go home and read the next verses that follow. It's a great uh, a great uh, analogy of someone all suited up, ready for war. Look also, because I like to give you more than one witness, Second Peter. Peter is Kepha in Hebrew, so Second Kepha, chapter 2 and verse 4. And we read there, for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, we've talked about that, they're the ones that followed Satan. If he didn't spare them, cast them into hell, committed them to pits of darkness, reserved for judgment. Once again, we see the illusion of darkness to Satan, to the evil, the sin, what is otherworldly. We're going to go to Jude. Jude is a little book. Just ahead of uh, Revelation, there is only one chapter. So when I say June 6, it's verse 6. And if you're trying to do it on a tablet, you may have to put in 1, 6 together. I found that out for the way. And angels who did not keep their own domain, they abandoned their proper abode. These are angels that left their original domain. Again, these would be the ones who follow Satan. He is kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Notice again, darkness, Satan, judgment, evil. Now, let me, let your mind think on this for just a moment. Do you realize what this verse is telling us? There are some fallen angels so bad that the Lord doesn't even allow them a time of looseness. We know the demonic activity is fallen angels. We know that there is plenty that we have to deal with. Thank God, if these are even worse, he tied them up. Wow. Amen. Makes me really appreciate. Okay, going back to Genesis, we'll look at that darkness then with this all in our minds. And we're going to Genesis 1, and we're still in verse 2. It tells us this darkness was over the surface of the deep, or over the face of the deep. Now, when I get into my Hebrew, and I am not a Hebrew scholar, but I have sources that help me understand, it's hard for me to bring all of this down. Um, it's hard for me to understand it all, all the way through creation. As I'm studying it, it just, my mind just, so forgive me if I, you know, if I'm not communicating clearly, let me know and I'll try to do better. But I honestly, it's, I'm, I've been asking the Lord, give me a handle on this to teach it. When we go into the Hebrew, we get the idea that this darkness, there is a roaring, there is a rage in this darkness. It
notes in the sense that we are familiar with that fit into our context with raging waters or roaring waters. That's an interesting thought. We'll look real quick at Psalm. Tehillim, Psalm 46, and for, I'm sorry, 42 and verse 7, and I will put that on the board because this is not on your chart, on your um, cross-references that I gave you. Um, what happened is, Rochelle found another source. Since I did up your cross-references, and I'm blowing my mind reading it. <laughs> so, I'd love to bring you to the fullness. I'm going to add in a few <coughs> verses. So, as I do, I will put them up here. And you can just add them in wherever you would like. This one is Psalm and 42. And did I say 6? Seven. 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 Okay. Okay, so Psalm 42, 7. In Psalm 42, 7, we read, Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. Your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. Have you ever been to uh, Niagara Falls? Yes. Yeah, I haven't, but I've been told it's deafening. It's absolutely deafening. I've been by waterfalls that are roaring. But I understand that's even more deafening. So here is where we're getting that idea. And that idea in the Hebrew seems to be right because Psalm 42, 7 is saying that. Remember, we let Scripture back up what we believe. We don't believe it because we want to believe it. We don't believe it because we think it. We believe it because we see it in the Word of God. Now, we also see these raging waters in relation to flood. Go with me to Exodus 15. Exodus chapter 15. And I'll put it on the board in verse 5. Exodus 15 and 5. Again, it's not on your cross-references. So, Exodus 15 and verse 5. And here we read, The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. And if you read it, I probably should have taken this more into to contact, uh, con context. Um, well, verse 8 tells us, At the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood like a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I'll pursue, I'll overtake, I'll divide the spoil. What are we reading about? How about the Red Sea parting, possibly? Does it not sound like that? But that's what God did. So again, we're in the waters, we're in the oceans, we're in the depths, we're in flood. And we see that there has been a separation here. So it just gives us an idea of how Scripture talks about the deep, meaning waters as well as meaning the darkness. Okay? Um, another that might be easier to understand, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 7. I'm going to use the shortcut on Deuteronomy. I'll be here till the end of class writing it out. <laughs> Deuteronomy 8 and verse 7. That's Dabarim. Chapter 8 and verse 7, where we read, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a good land, I'm sorry, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, of springs flowing forth in valleys and hills. So here we see that water is good. I want to bring you that you didn't notice anything about darkness here. You didn't notice anything about judgment here. So I'm not telling you all water is bad. Water is good. Water is essential to our lives, and we know that. Okay, but I think that we begin to get the idea. Let's look what Job said about the depths of the sea. Go with me to Job. Eo, Job. And I have lost my tablet. Okay, I'll have to go to this one. It might be a translation that you're not as familiar with because this is our Jewish one. Hopefully I can find the words that I want out of it. Uh, we are going to... There it is, Job 28, 14. Job 28, 14. And there we will read. <clears throat> the deep says, it isn't in me. And the sea says, it isn't with me. It can't be obtained with gold, nor can silver be weighed out to buy it. Okay, what are they talking about? Wisdom. Wisdom's not in the deep. Here's your negative connotation again. Wisdom's not there. In the depths of, of the sea or whatever, it's not there. Job 38 and verse 16. Job 38 and verse 16. And we read there, Have you gone down to the springs of the sea or explored the limits of the deep? And look at verse 17. Have the gates of death been revealed to you? The gates of death like 
darkness. Again, we see that evil connotation. Okay? So I think that's enough to give you an idea. I forgot to put Job up there. So um, what I read was Job 28, 14. And then I read Job 38, 38, 60. 60. Yeah. 38, 60. Okay? So that you have those references added in if you'd like. Okay. And I'm building on something here also. As we go through the days of creation, that's why I'm laying down this foundation. Because we're going to keep building on these Hebrew roots that give us more depth. Um, it is fascinating. I'm not going to tell it all to you now because I am even still studying and developing it in my mind that we're going to be looking at the light and the darkness in this first day. Let me bring out to you very clearly, we're not talking about the sun, moon, and the stars. We're not talking about sun for day and the moon and the stars for night. Those are created on day four. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something else. We're talking about light and darkness. So we've got to find out what light and darkness mean in day one when we're not talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars. Okay, well, is this like, um, it sounds like somebody's fighting among all of this stuff, you know, dark and all of this stuff between the first, first um, sentence and then, you know, when mm -hmm. you turn the right. light inside out. Right, right. In essence, when it was turned inside out, there was like a cataclysmic result on the face of the earth. Formless and dark, and void. And that's what's there now, and we're going to see what God brings out now. He's going to separate it. Well, he's that. not fighting with Satan. No, so. no, he's not fighting with Satan. I can see how you can think yeah. that, but no, that isn't, that isn't the point. The Satan was judged, God rules, <coughs> Satan, you know, score one for God, zero for Satan. Over. <laughs> Game one. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, even though, and there are a lot of, um, a lot of uh, heresies, a lot of false teachings out there that are even going to teach you that the earth was covered with the waters and the waters gave birth to this and gave birth to that, gave birth right down to giving birth to man. Well, that is not what my Bible says. <laughs> is there any uh, scriptural symbolism between um, when Jesus said, I'll make you fisher of men, like men uh, being in this darkness of water, well, we can see they need to be fished out of it. They need to be brought to the truth, the, the light. We can see that. Um, as far as from the Hebrew, I don't know. I'd have to go look and see if I see anything. But I, I think he used the analogy that they were so familiar with. They were fishermen. If they had been you know, shepherds, I think he would have used it in the sheep analogy. Like yeah. when he talked to David you know, about taking the one little sheep. He met David on, you know, the fact that he was a shepherd and knew what that one little precious sheep would mean. So I think he just used something they were familiar with, but can we see the connotation? Sure. Sure. They're in the darkness and need to be fished out. Need to have sanctified bait go down and get them. <laughs> yes, so do you have any extra E's? Yes. You get E and F. We're now known as five and six. <laughs> <laughs> While you do that, um, my, my son was a fireman, and uh, he became a pastor, and my brother-in-law said to him, oh, Lord, Ruben, you, you were first rescuing people from fire, now you're rescuing people from hell. That's right. And actually... Um, my dad used to use an analogy, he didn't do it often, but I remember with one Jewish woman, he was trying so hard to um, to get across to him, you know, that, that out of his love he was sharing this with him, and he was so opposed to it. And sometimes it, it will happen when you are witnessing, they rile against it. Don't let that stop you. you they're not coming against you, they're coming against your God. You know, yeah. they're like like uh, Maria said earlier, they're the enemy of our God. Yes. Yeah, you know, and so um, because this one couldn't understand why, my dad said to him, "Let me give it to you in this analogy. If I knew your house was on fire, would you want me to tell you?" And he said, "Well, of course." And he said, "Your spiritual house is on fire." <laughs> He's wow. really awesome. Same ideas. Yes. Same ideas. 
And I'll tell you, those of us who have seen fire up close and personal, in a way that I don't ever care to remember, not only are firemen huge in my mind, but you do, there are spiritual lessons that are there, and you do, the horrors of hell are even that much greater mm -hmm. because of what I experienced. Um, short form, my neighbor lost his life in a house fire. And we had run in trying to bring him out, and it was too late. What I saw still shakes me to the core when I realize and take that into the spiritual world. Wow. What love, what love has set us free. Wow. Back to our darkness, though, what I want to bring out is that the earth and the firmament, and firmament is our heavens, are still undistinguishable. That's why Dora's reading here, it sounds all murky and mucky and chaotic and, you know, whatever words your versions get. They're still unformed. They're still wrapped in this darkness now that we know was a judgment on Eden that we're going to call Earth after this. But what happens? Does God leave it that way? No. Yeah, not our God. It tells us darkness is over the surface of the deep, over the face of it all. It was very deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The Spirit of God uh, spirit in Hebrew is ruach. It's the same word for breath. It's the same word for wind. But when it identifies as the spirit, we know it's not just the wind. We know this is the Holy Spirit of God. What did we have just enter in into our verses 1 and 2? We now have our complete trinity. That's where I wanted you to go. Remember, in the beginning, gods created, and we saw that was not little gods. That we saw that we saw from the Hebrew, it said son created, and it said God created. We looked at other scriptures, and we found other scriptures that said both. You will read in scripture that God created the heavens and the earth, and you will read in scriptures that Yeshua Jesus created the heavens and the earth. Are they contradicting? No. 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 Are we not seeing the deity? Are we not, uh, not, sorry, not the deity. Are we not seeing the equality of the God yet? That God the Father and the one called God the Son, this is not a son who was created later. This is not a son who was <coughs> less than. This is not a son who steps down. This is the same way that, that Gary is a husband, a father, and a son all at the same time. He's equally all of those. Now, he did have a start for those, <laughs> but God did but we see the equality of the two. Yet we know our God to be a triunity. So where was the spirit? We have that God created. We have that, that you should Jesus created. And how did I say it last week? I like that, and I don't have my note with me. But um, uh, I can't think of it now. It was, it was what each role did. I'll bring it next week. But I remember that it was... Um, no, I can't even pull it back. I'm sorry. I hate to do that, but it's, I'm stuck for the moment. Um, I'll, I'll give it to you next week. I'll tease you. you got to come next week. <laughs> um, but again, it shows how all three were involved in a different way, you know, and yet they're all three, one working on the same. So what we have here now is the Spirit of God, the third part of our triunity, being brought into the way that we're learning how he was involved from the very start with our creation also. Spirit of God is very God himself, so it's not any... You know, we just have to understand it. Our Hebrew again gives it to us because the verb is, is again, we see it in a singular, a plural noun. We see that we've got more than one acting on a singular, the same way we saw when, when it's talking about the Father and the Son at the same time. Okay, now, the, the, when it says in the Hebrew, Ruach Elohim, Spirit of God, it's not saying that the, that the breath of, of God, that the wind of God caused it. In other words, God didn't go, and it happened. No, this is showing us that this is a real spirit. This is, how am I going to put it? Because I, I can't use human terms, but this is part, this is God. Okay, it's not just an action that happened that God did something. This is the spirit of God. Yeah. Very God himself at the same time. Do we fully understand? No. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need the spirit. Loretta, you go there by your body. <laughs> 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 
I know what you mean. The Spirit of God witnesses to us as the truth. But what we're seeing, maybe if I put it this way, we're seeing the creative act of God. We're seeing the creative Spirit of God carrying out. Um, and that's the principle that we see of life also. We know that the Spirit breathed life into us. We became a living being. Um, let's see also what it says in the Psalms. Go to Psalm 33. Again, off your, your uh, references. This is where I'm at again. Uh, so I'll put it on the board again. Psalm 33, and we're going to go to verse 6. Psalm 33, 6. I will raise these so I have room. I don't think you'll all think I'm crazy, but I, when my mother-in-law was dying, and she was about to, to go to heaven with the Lord, the Spirit of God, I felt the Spirit of God in that room. Oh, absolutely. I, I can't absolutely. explain it to you, but that's how I felt. Anyone who is a believer understands. Mm -hmm. Anyone who is not does not understand. We all have those times, I, I yes. think that we can say where we have felt his spirit, we felt his presence. Yes, yes, yes. Um, definitely. And I can tell story after story of people at the time of death that that's absolutely what had happened. Look at Psalm 33 and verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Do we not agree? Yes. Who's the word? Jesus. Jesus. In the beginning was the word. The word, the word was with God. And the word was God. Okay, so we've got the word and God in the beginning, and we've got them both creating. We know that. We see that in that first phrase in verse 6, but now look at the second part. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hopes. Now again, even though it says the breath of his mouth, it's not telling us he blew. What it's meaning is the spirit is like breath. The spirit is the breath of God going out. Remember, we're going to read, and I think you know ahead, he hovered over the face of the earth, okay? He, this is action. This is not just, a, a, I'm blowing a candle out, okay? This is action. This is a, a being, a heavenly being, obviously, the heavenly being, the God, who is moving in a spirit form. We know Yeshua, Jesus, the Son, who existed in the beginning, didn't have a body, did he? But he does now. And yet I'll throw you for a curve. Go to Daniel 8 and look at the, don't do it now, but do it on your own. Um, go look at Daniel's dream. The Ancient of Days is sitting on the throne. And the Lord approaches him. So you know the Ancient of Days is God the Father. Well, he's sitting on the throne. Does a spirit sit? Do you see a spirit sit? <laughs> but the Ancient of Days is seen that way. The description of Revelation that we couldn't decide, and we finally decided, rightfully so, that it was describing both God and the Son. And we have the hair as wool, the eyes like fire, we have the feet, um, brass, bronze, bronze. I can't get those two words out. But, you know, the, the feet are brass, they're judgment. You know, we see all that and much in between. Okay, and remember, I took you to Revelation 5 today. God was sitting on the throne with something in his hand. Does God have a hand? Not in the way that Jesus has a hand, because Jesus took on human form. So he has a hand. Jesus was born with that little tiny hand. Miriam looked down. You think she counted fingers and toes like some of you mommies have done? <laughs> I think so too. But God didn't, and yet he's... The, I forget the word that's used, and I'll, I'll bring it to you later on. It, when we say that they take on human form, we say if it's God, it's a theophany, if it's Christ, it's a Christophany. But there's another word when they're given human characteristics. And here's my point with what I was saying earlier about Satan being in heaven, uh, accusing us, and how can he be in heaven when he's you know, sinful and not contaminate heaven? You see, we're not fully understanding we don't understand how the ancient of days sat on a throne, had a scroll in his hand. We don't understand how he has hair and eyes and all these features that are human. But God relates it to us in a way that we can understand. The same way that if you were all going to go talk to a four-year-old, you're not going to use words that are this long. You're going to break it down and you're going to make an analogy that they can relate to. You're going to talk to them on their level. As they get older, you're going to talk to them about what they're interested in. 
In other words, if you want to get to boys who are involved in sports, put it into a sports thing and watch them listen. You can do that even with their homework. Set up goals. Let them learn goals, and you've got them. Well, that's what God did. He said, I know you poor little humans. <laughs> I'm going to relate it to you in a way you can. What was the text in Daniel? In Daniel 8, chapter 8. Um, gives it Daniel's dream. You want to look at his dream. And let me make sure I'm right. Now that I'm saying that, I'm sure I am, though. I'm sure I am. But let me just make sure. Um, on, Daniel 8 and Daniel 3? No, not Daniel 3. I don't know what else I said. And I went off. Roger, I'm in Daniel 8. I want where the ancient is. You know what? I think it may is nine. It's nine. Seven. Seven. Verse nine. Is it seven? <laughs> Forgive me, but I'm glad to get on record and do it right. There we go. Here we go. Daniel 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, behold, when like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And it goes on. So there you go. 7.13 starts it. Daniel 7.13. Yes. I forget some of you weren't here when we did Daniel also. Daniel is an absolutely fascinating book to study. Yeah, that's of course, right. tell me what Bible book is. <laughs> Thank you. I have no idea why, but it's... So, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. we're going to keep going while, while he does. I appreciate him. He takes care of all of this this for me. Um, okay, where was I going? Oh, okay. So we have this, the creative spirit of God in an essence is the spirit that sparks life. The same way we talk about it in the spiritual, that no one comes to the Father, but that he draws them. How does he draw them? He draws them by his spirit. It's his spirit that, that brings that, that, that quickening. Is that, is that a word that will work? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, or like I say, a spark. Okay. So, that spirit is the same spirit that worked on the formless, lifeless mass. It brought a separating. We're going to read that. The light's going to be separated from the darkness, and it's going to go on in its creation. We saw it. Um, it's going to prepare. Ah, I'm back on. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's going to prepare this world for human life. Everything set in motion. Did you ever wonder why God didn't create man first and then create man's environment? Yeah. He had to make the environment ready for man. Yes. So he creates it first. And it's amazing. Remember how I brought out two classes ago? The just right universe? Mm -hmm. How it's just right to inhabit human life and all those points that were given? It's fascinating. And when I get into my Hebrew, I keep, I want to cheat, I want to tell you about day four, because I'm saying day four, and it relates to, to day one. Let me just say, every word is so perfect in scripture. That's why I have a stop and look at as many of these words as we can. And I'll just give you one little hint, and I'll fill you in later. But we're going to see a cycle through this. We're going to see all the way through creation, evening in the morning, evening in the morning, evening in the morning. Okay? Now we're going to learn a lot about that. We're going to learn it in different ways. We're going to learn it the way we know it now for a cycle of time. But we're going to see that there's more to it than just that. We're going to see how light was created on day one, and yet we don't have the sun, the moon, and the stars till day four. So what was created? What's going on? We're going to see all of it at the end of each day. And this is to me. That's why I'm all excited over it. I hadn't thought, seen this thought before. At the end of each day, we see, we see that it says... That God created, and it was good. Okay? That in the Hebrew is God's way of saying, this is complete, and it's perfect. Okay? He completed whatever he created. He created it perfectly, and it's completed. Now, when we get to day three and day four, which tie into each other, at the end of day three, God doesn't say that, and that God thought it was good. He says, and it was so, but he doesn't give the, and it was good, until the completion of the whole thing that had to come together. And I'll show you what I mean when we do day three and day four. That when they totally came together, then it was a complete act, and he said, and it was good. Isn't that fascinating?
fascinating. And maybe you don't, it does me. It does me. It does me. Because I see again in it how every word matters. Yeah. How every thought is complete. Every, as Hebrew, jot and tittle, every mm -hmm. dot your eye and cross your T mm -hmm. is important in Scripture. That's why we stay so long on our words. That's why we go back to Bereshit, Barat Elohim, mm -hmm. and we learn in it, God created, Jesus created. We learn that it was in the beginning. We learn that they were before the beginning for it to be in the beginning. We learn that they were above and beyond what we call time. And then we move it into the next word of created. And we're going to see as we go through <coughs> these days, not everything was created out of nothing. You mean God used something? But I thought, Rochelle, God created everything. I will answer that riddle as we get to it. <laughs> if you're really done, then I'll tell you after class. But again, I'm just seeing the depth of the truth of our scriptures. And when God says it's so exacting, it just illuminates us and it gives us all this depth and this understanding. So again, coming back into this, we have in our next phrase, or completing our phrase here, because we want to complete it just like God did. We have in our phrase with the Spirit, that the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, the word's moving over. I don't know what you have, but if you have something like brooded or hovered, that's good. Because that's giving you a little more depth of the meaning. It isn't that he just flew over. But what does a mom of bird do? Babies. Have you ever heard the brooding? She's brooding over her babies. We'll often say they're hovering over their babies. We're what hence we put our babies under our wing and don't you dare get near her, you know, mama can be a wet hand. <laughs> well this is the idea we're getting that the spirit hovered, brooded over his creation. See, it's not just God the Father, God the Son. It's God the, the Holy Spirit, Ruch HaKodesh, also. His Spirit, who brooded over, who hovered over, who took tender care to bring out something so beautiful that we get an awesome creation. I mean, I can't fathom our creation, and I think about it all the time. Maybe that's my Jewishness, because we're taught on Shabbat, is to remind us to think about the Creator, the Creator God, and take us back to the beginning. That's one of the reasons that I'm always fascinated by it, and I'm looking at, at so much creation. The variety. <coughs> Look at this room. Not one of us looks like the other one. And even those who look identical, they know the, the difference between each other. <laughs> God is amazing and he's awesome. And I remember something I meant to bring out earlier and didn't when we were talking about Yeshua having to become human. There was a man who was about to step his big old foot down on an anthill. And as his foot was coming down, the shadow was coming, the whole ant started scattering. And he saw it, he caught himself. He didn't like to even hurt an ant. And he had no intention of stomping on it. So he caught himself and he moved away from it. But as he looked, all these little ants are panicking and going in all kinds of directions. And he thought, you poor little ants. I don't want to hurt you. I wish you could understand that. How could I help you understand? Oh, if I became an ant, I'd know how to communicate with you. And he thought, that's what you did for me, God. Mm -hmm. You became like me, that you could communicate to me the love and the grace of our God and bring us into that relationship. Mm -hmm. Isn't he awesome? Isn't yes, he amazing? He is. Isn't yes, he, he is. ineffable? Yes. <laughs> for you new ones, I get to explain it. Ineffable was a word I came across at a time when the words just were not enough to be describing our God. They never are. Ineffable means it is too big to be contained in a word or a phrase. Is that not our God? Mm -hmm. So I taught my class in ineffable. Um, Anita said, uh, uh, um, and I'm sorry, I'm doing that all day. No, I did it right this time. I did it right. My mind's spinning fast. Anita said that her dad used to use that. Her dad was the pastor. I had never, I had to look up the word when I found it in my studies. I had to look it up. And I fell in love with it, and I will drive you all nuts with it. <laughs> but I can see our ineffable God. 
Now, the mama bird hovers over her babies also to give them her warmth, to enable them to develop, you know, to grow in this life, to develop their powers that they need. Let me show you Deuteronomy, Dabarim, chapter 32 and verse 11. Again, this may be a familiar verse to you. But in case if it's not, Deuteronomy 32, 11, I like to back up what I say by scripture. 32 and verse 11. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them and he carried them on his pinions. His feathers, there you go. Who are we talking about? God. God. And yet we're seeing him described like 3211? I remember right. We're seeing him described the same way that our Hebrew is telling us the Spirit of God moved over the face of the earth. To hover, to protect, to carry, to, to uh, nurture, uh, like the eagle, like the eagle. Um, I, I did a, a whole message on birds once. Amazing. Again, God's creation. Absolutely amazing. I'll bring you out points Michelle, at different times. Yes, ma'am. I just got tickled. I get just so tickled by the Holy Spirit because he just reminded me of how, you know, our babies are in their womb with the water and, you know, hovering and the Holy Spirit is protecting Very good. the baby. Just like, like with that. Elizabeth, right? Wait, I'm not Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Mary's cousin. Yes. Where the Holy Spirit was there. Yes. Nurturing yes. down the back end. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amazing. When, if you don't know that part of scripture, when Elizabeth, who was pregnant with Yochanan John, and Mary, Mary, who was pregnant with Yeshua Jesus, when they got together, Elizabeth was a little further along, I think six months further along, if I remember right. Um, and, uh, and yet that's a fetus developing in the womb. But when they came together, Yochanan jumped in her womb because he was in the presence of the Spirit of our God. Yes. They met in the water from the first time. I'm sorry. They met in the water from the first time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. And what did you say, Pam? Doesn't the bird push his baby out of the nest and kind of fly or die? And Mama does, but she's not fly or die. She pushes them out <laughs> so that they'll, ready. yes, because he's ready, he's so ready. they'll, they'll, they'll do their wings, but notice yeah. what she does. She's right there, and baby starts to go down because baby's either tired or wasn't ready, and brings right up and puts him right back in the nest. Yes, that's yes. something amazing to watch. It, that's yes. cool. So yes. none of them have that. No, no, they do not. They do not. They they survive it. <laughs> it's not a bad mama. <laughs> there are some bad mamas. It, it is amazing to watch. I watch hummingbirds from inception and had a close-up view with them. And when it came the day for the babies to fly, mom spent two-thirds of the day, so they had two, then often I have two, a boy and a girl, very interesting. But uh, um, mom has stayed with the second one about two-thirds of the day. The, the, the first one flew off mid-morning. The second one couldn't seem to quite do as much and even went and landed on a bicycle uh, on the spokes and oh stayed there for a long time. And Mama Hubbard, if anyone got near that bike, if anyone got, oh boy, I mean, she might be a little, but you knew something was coming <laughs> at you. And she waited and waited and waited, and finally we saw a little take off, and Mom went to, and I happened to have a feeder, and guess who showed up on my feeder? Mama with her baby. It was fascinating. <laughs> Some of the babies don't make it because can't get stuff. That's the part of this life that I do not like. I will be so glad when we're on the other side. Okay, uh, let's go ahead. I think have I done all verse two? Oh, wow. Okay, the, too soon to quit, right? Let's go ahead and go just a little bit further. Um, no, but yeah, maybe I didn't give you all of my. Okay. Where do I have, I should have face, over the face, over the surface of the deep. Did I bring out the surface of the deep, the presence, um, that there was, there was a darkness uh, where the deep was? Did I bring it out that they 
Because if you may have, you may go home and read and say, what does that mean? If you've got the word face there, it's the presence of, of the depth. It doesn't mean just a face. You know, there was a depth that was there. And then the deep I, I did bring out to you refers um, later to the waters of the oceans. I didn't show you that in Genesis. Let me show you that in Genesis real quick. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11. Because that's right in our context. There we go. Genesis 7 and verse 11. And this is back on your cross-reference page. That is there. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the seventh month, second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open. The floodgates of the sky were open. Okay, so we've got the, we know that, that later we call these, you know, the oceans that opened up. And we'll go into that to when it broke up when this happened. And so it, it's using the same words here. The deep, in the Hebrew here, is the same. The great deep burst open. Um, refers later to waters. Chapter 8 and verse 2 in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 2. You can turn your page and my tablet will not cooperate. Okay, let me try this one. That's why I have two of them up here besides having two different versions. I also have one that likes to freeze. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 2. Also the fountains of the deep and the windows of the sky were stopped. The rain from the sky was restrained. We're going to talk about where rain comes from. We're going to talk about when rain came. We're going to talk about all this, but the deep, the waters, all of that is the same. I did bring out the third person of the Godheads revealed with the Spirit of God, uh, that even though it's translated wind and breath later, because it's the same word in the Hebrew, it's just a word that you have to understand from context. And we see the context, it was far more than just a breath. Uh, just the blowing of wind. Uh, it does indicate the energizing force of God. And I think that's what it said. The Holy Spirit was the energizer. The Father the Father thought it. The Lord did it. And the Holy Spirit energized it. It was something like that that I brought up. But it, it did it well. I'll try to get it memorized and bring it back next week. Anyway, what we see is his omnipresence also. That he's everywhere. Everywhere. Okay? And then I did bring out... Um, let me also bring out, before we move off of moved, <laughs> brooded, hugger, it can also mean vibrated. And it's going to be very interesting as we start studying in our creation. We're going to see why I'm bringing it out. But let me just say now the transmissions of energy in the operations of the cosmos could be seen in the form of waves. Now we know that today. We know that there are radioactive waves. We know that there are the waves that um, for our hearing, what did they um, call them? Um, sound um, waves. Sound waves. <laughs> <laughs> My mind's too complicated right now. Uh, so it, it's talking about that light waves, sound waves, uh, heat waves. It could be referring to that also, Ocean that waves. this this hovering caused a vibration that is what we've learned to call by these other names. We'll see that a little bit more. Uh, waves typically are back and forth movements, and it would seem that, that that's what the Holy Spirit was doing as he was hovering and watching over it all and protecting it all and, and forming it as it goes because he's setting it into motion. Um, it's also interesting that when the Septuagint was written, the Septuagint is the Greek version of the Hebrew, and it was accepted by scholars, it was written by 70 who, who studied it, that they use the same word for spirit that we have in 2 Peter, because that's where we have our Greek. 2 Peter, 2 Peter 1, 21, says that men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's the same word. So the spirit moves, and this is what happens. Okay. So now I think I've covered verse... Two very well, and we'll go into a little bit of three, whether we get all the way through three or not. We'll try. We'll see if we can get light. Okay? Uh, going back to Genesis 1, verse 3 now. Then God said, okay? I've got to stop. got to think right there. The power of his spoken word. God said. Okay? God said. Now, the spirit. The power of the spoken word typifies he who is the word who made all things. Remember? Yochanan, we quoted it earlier. John 1, 
one to three. Okay, because we've got God said, so word was spoken. Tie that in. Look real quick to make it clear for yourself. John chapter one and verses one through three. And I know you know these, but in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came to be through him, and without him, nothing may have been. Okay? What are we reading here? God said. So we know right away, even though God said, the fact that he spoke, and that the second part of the Godhead, who we refer to as God the Son, is the word that's showing us, again, their dual creativity. We see both of them in this. Again, we can't separate them any more than we could in Revelation chapter 1. So, he spoke, and it happened. The Father is the source of all things, going back to Genesis 1, 3. Um, this, oh, here it is. I do have it in my notes here. The, it, the way I liked it was the Father is the source of all things. Mm -hmm. The Spirit is the energizer of all things. And the Son, the Word, is the revealer of all things. Just Father, one way to look yeah. at it. I like that. Can the you Father's. Write on the board? You want it on the board? Please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll do it in short form. The Father, God the Father, is the source. Okay? He's the source. Then it said, God the Son, did it refer to the Son? Yes, the word. That's how. So I'll put son, and I'll put in parentheses word, is the revealer. And we know he is the revealer that we wouldn't understand. Is that O-R or E-R? We would not understand God if it were not for Yeshua Jesus. Do you realize that that word for him, all we would know about God, the Father, is one up in heaven? We would not know that relationship. We do understand it because the Son revealed it. And then it finishes it off by saying the Spirit is the energizer. All three acting together. Spirit bringing the energy, the Father sourcing it, and the Son making it where we can understand it, regulating it. I, I just, I like that. Mm -hmm. It sure has got holes because nothing's going to get God perfectly, <laughs> but just at face value. I think that is something we can say and we can enjoy in this. Okay, so God in his sourcing said, let there be light. Okay, can I go that far with my phrase? I can't. Now, notice it doesn't say that God created the light. He didn't say, let me create light. He said, let there be light. The original creative act is what's not being referred to. It's being implied that it's already been there. There's something that God is using now. The idea from the Hebrew makes it a little more clear is the idea that he made the light to appear. So he made it to appear. Okay? I could have a light on a lamp, and I could bring it in, that would make it appear. It was still real out there. It was already on, but it wasn't made real to you until I brought it in. So God now has taken light, and he's made it appear. He's made it visible. Okay? God speaking would create energy. God is light. When you know that, then the energy would be light. Remember we said darkness is not God. The darkness we see represents just Satan and the evil. But we know that God did not, and we talked about how we don't believe that he created this earth in darkness because how could he as he spoke? Darkness is, is not a complete perfect picture. How could he speak and make a chaotic world? If God speaks and it happens, there's no time or place for chaos, for evolution, for a process, not even time for what we're reading now where light's going to be brought out from the darkness, where we're going to see certain things are still an act of creation. 
certain things or not. We'll learn to look and see which Hebrew word has been given that created out of nothing or something made visible, something made to come into the picture. That's what we're seeing here. The idea of light is that it was being brought into the world in a way that we're going to see it separated from the darkness. Look with me at 1 John 1, 5. And if this is hard to understand, don't worry, you get a whole week to work on it. <laughs> and try to figure it out and come back and help me if you do. <laughs> First John chapter, oops, I got chapter four. I hit my tablet when I should have. First John, oh, I know it wants to log up again. First John, okay, I still have first John chapter five. And verse five. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. See why I don't believe that it could have been created with darkness? Darkness came because God judged it. But he didn't create it dark. He didn't create it chaotic. He didn't create it. To me, chaos, a world of chaos that needed to be perfected, would say that God created imperfect. I don't believe God can create imperfect any more than I believe he can sin. So, anybody wants to throw at me, well, God can do anything he wants. Sure he can. But he won't be God if he ever creates. If, if he ever, I can't even say it. I don't even want those words out of my mouth. You've got my thoughts. Yeah. So, okay. Um, let me see if I'm giving you everything. Make sure because I've got my other sources that I'm bringing in. Okay. Scientifically, the first thing that's created by the divine word, or the first thing that's brought into being, is light. Now, what it's showing us in the Hebrew also is, and, and don't think this, I have to constantly remind myself not to. It's called an elementary light. Now, that doesn't mean elementary like you go to elementary school and then you grow up and go to junior high. Okay, that's not the type of elementary. It's more of a, of a beginning, a basic, and there's going to be something more that comes out of it. So we see that in the Hebrew, it talks about a light material or an element of light. Maybe that's the way the element rather than elementary. Uh, but it's not talking about a body. When we talk about the creation of the sun, the moon, the stars, we're going to talk about bodies from the Hebrew that they actually took this kind of form. But this is, is a, a light. Here's where it's just hard. How do you put it into words? It's a light that's going to proceed out of the atmosphere that, that is going to separate so that we can understand darkness. Do you realize if we did no light and dark, we wouldn't know that we do know it. How do we know it? Because we know the opposite. You know light because of dark. You know dark because of light. So here's what we're seeing. God is moving in a way. Rather than creating the sun, the moon, and the stars, he is speaking an energy that brings this light into this realm now. And when you remember that God is light, how could he have created what he is? See, I mean, he created everything. So I'm saying that poorly, too. See, as soon as the words are out of my mouth, I, mean, I, I, I think... I think it's like he is light. He is light. So he, he uh, um, made an opening. Now, when you open something, you, he's reflecting his light. Okay, and we're going to be careful there. You were good starting, but once you get to reflecting, we have well, our sun, our moon, and our stars no, all right. No, no, no. But, but this opening, this moving the darkness so that the light is shining through. Right, exactly. That's what the spirit is going to do. You have a flashlight, and you go into, let's say you, if you have it off, and you are in darkness, and I and I flip it on, it will, it will let me, uh, that light will reflect, but I know what you're saying, that the light as a, but it, he is light. Yes. Yes. But we, light. we weren't just seeing him. Right. We're yeah. seeing something yes. he was bringing of himself into our world. Could you say uh, that's the glory of God? I'm going to say no. I don't think so because I'm just thinking of Revelation 5 and 4. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking about the cross. 
when Jesus became sin, mm -hmm. there was total sin. darkness. Yes. Like oh, God, I forgot to bring that out. That was like, in my notes. Like God separated himself and there was darkness. Mm -hmm. So at that time, because if we went for the gap theory, there was chaos happening. Yes. So God was not present in that And darkness. it was the judgment and it was the evil. And the mm -hmm. darkness exemplified that. Yeah. Yes. So when he said, let there be light, mm -hmm. he could probably be saying, come now, God the Son, show yourself. And I think that the, the light, right now we have light. Mm -hmm. I mean, now we don't have, we have the sun, but we have the light and we have the darkness, which light, we're, we're awake. Darkness, we're asleep. He had right. something in mind about right. that. Right, but oh, that's okay. what you're going to see with the sun. And see, that's why since I'm spending day four, I'm, I'm, yeah. there's a very fine line of understanding to separate these two. Okay. Because we do have a hard time judging how we have light without having a sun. Even though we're not looking at the sun, we're seeing the, the light. what came from the sun. Well, in essence, we're seeing what comes from the sun, S-O-N. Uh, and, and again, I'm going to use that light waves that he spoke these waves into an existence that brought light to because we're going to see that the earth is rotated on an axis. Later, it's going to rotate around the sun. It's not rotating around the sun now because there is no sun yet. Uh, but the darkness would also come making the night. And we're going to see that that comes with day one. We have the evening and the morning. Yes. What we really have there is the darkness and the light. Mm -hmm. We know that it was evening and morning because we know what God put in motion. And as we continue on learning, we'll understand and be able to go back and apply <coughs> that to day one. And, and in essence, it's close. I get your idea, Shekinah Glory, Arlu, and I can't totally say no, mm -hmm. but I struggle with it a little bit because it's going to come and go, and his Shekinah Glory is constant. But then he he didn't, you don't always see that on the face of the earth. He took his Shekinah Glory out of the temple. I was thinking, too, temple. that let there be Lord Jesus, <laughs> you know, because... Yeah. Right, yeah, but it wasn't the creation of the Lord. No, it wasn't not. the Lord in it's relation to the earth either yeah. at this point. That's, even that's what we It's his that. son. Let there be light now. It's part of his creative process. And, and I think we're saying the same thing because it's, it's yeah. putting that, that into motion. Yeah. But it's, it is very, very difficult. And I, I challenge you. Think on it this way and separate what you know about light from the sun. You know, moon, stars, night, because we don't want to think about that yet. And it's very difficult to let go of that. That's all we really know and understand. But we're going back to something more creative before that stage even. And I think that's probably a good point to stop on because what we're going to get into as soon as we get into this, and I think that's where, um, oh, where is Genesis? Let me see where first three hands, but I think, and I want to give you a thought just before I lose you, so hang tight for one second. Yeah, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So when he spoke it, it it's in existence, it happens, whether it's in light ways or however he's done it. We know that the, he, this God the Father and God the Son together. Um, let me also read you real quick, Revelation 21, 23, because this is the other end of the spectrum of our time. Revelation 21, verse 23. It is in your cross-references. We're talking about the, the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, verse 22 tells us there's no temple for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Verse 23, the city, the new Jerusalem that we're having here described, has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it. And it's the lamp is and it's the lamp is the lamp. Okay. Twenty-two, chapter twenty-two and verse five. One more time. Twenty-two and verse five. Okay. I will never not have my uh, hard copy because you just can't trust. Twenty-two five. And there shall be no night there. They need no lamp, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That is the light that is the Lord. That's apart from this, but now we're talking about the new Jerusalem, not the earth. But in essence, we're kind of getting that idea that he brought his light in. What we're going to see as we go on to verse 5, and here's where we're stopping. 
we'll see that, that it, we get it called the light day, we get the evening called night. But when we get that word, he called the light day, and it was already brought up in class a little while back, we have to look at what that word means in our Hebrew and in our context. Because it's one Hebrew word. It's yom, Y-O-M. Yom, that means day. Okay? Whoops, that means day. I think I need a new marker. I need a new marker. Okay. Yom means day. Now, day. what? Greek or what? In Hebrew. I'm sorry. In Hebrew. Yom is Hebrew for day. But what I'm going to challenge you to be thinking is, are we talking now that God has a 24-hour day with no sun, moon, and stars? Are we talking about a period of time? Are we talking about, I'll throw out for you to, to get your mind thinking. When we study Revelation, we study the About day of the year. Lord. Do you remember how long the day of the Lord was? Yeah. The Lord started with the tribulation, goes all the way past the kingdom. Okay? So obviously that's not a sun, moon, and stars 24-hour day. But... Is that what's meant here? Because there are those who will tell you that we have periods of time. Eric just threw out with the Lord a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. What does it mean here? And how can we know? Because there are a couple of pretty strong ideas out there that argue against each other. And I'll give you what they're arguing. And let you use that mind God gave you <laughs> to decide. But I think the Hebrew, by the time we get through with our creation, I think the Hebrew makes it very clear. And I'll bring that out to you because that's where I get my answers. Okay? Any questions, comments? Are we all confused? No. Good. Good. You're. That's okay. I'm confused too, Laura. So I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around all this. But, um, it's a fascinating study. You will never get the total depth of it. You can go through it again and again and again. You'll still get more. That's our God. That's His word, and it's amazing. Okay. We'll close in prayer, and then we can go on and discuss or whatever you want. Okay. Any volunteer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this study and for your word, Lord God, my shall, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this day that you've given us, Lord, and help us to always look to you, walk the walk, Lord, be witnesses for you, Lord, and forgive us for we fail. Bless each and every one that's here, Lord, and, yes. and their needs that maybe weren't mentioned, Lord Jesus. Be with, be with us, Lord. Help us, Lord, as we walk the walk. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And I'll just simply say, go in the light. <laughs> Thank you, Rex.